Hi, I wanted to talk about a YouTube video that popped up some weeks ago regarding React Native's popularity and how it goes into detail about certain resources that are online that talk about which apps are using React Native and how the information might not be correct or at least misleading. Now, that being said, there is already a video by Theo that goes into a lot of detail regarding each of the specific points that was mentioned. So if you want to check that out, you can, but it's an hour long video. So it really goes into detail trying to combat some of these points. But I thought maybe it would be a good idea to take a positive spin on it and kind of talk why React Native might be a little bit more popular than you think. Now, the video in question is this React Native isn't as popular as you think by Tastemaker Design. And it kind of stirred up a few things in the community, especially cleaning up the docs. Um, you have to give it to him. The docs are not ideal. They're very out of date uh, regularly, constantly, because there's a lot of things kind of moving on the React world, on the React Native world especially, as there are now a lot of big players that put in a lot of effort, a lot of money. So it's kind of hard to keep up with uh, how things are changing. Now, the first thing that he looked at was the showcase. And you can see this has already been updated a lot of apps have been removed uh, just from the community as they realize okay this might be misleading but the main apps are still there right yeah Facebook Instagram Facebook ads uh, a lot of the Microsoft apps a lot of the Amazon apps Shopify as well you have Wix and you have all their big apps like Tesla um, Starlink is also using react native yada 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 so this is a little bit of a it's a sample of which apps are running React Native. Now you can also go to Expo, where Expo is another framework built on top of React Native. And they also have, uh, let's say, open list of customers who are using Expo, Brand, Brex, you know, fairly large companies. But you can also imagine that there is a list of companies who don't make it on this um, open, publicly available list. You should also check out the website by Evan Bacon, which is an engineer in Expo. He's a really cool guy. He really does a lot of stuff. And he kind of automated this process of decompiling and trying to figure out which apps are using Expo by just looking into the APAs and APKs from the app stores. And you can see his list is a lot more thorough, right? You can see in every category of the app stores, there are many, many, many apps using React Native and Expo. It might not be as popular as, let's say, the bigger apps using React Native, but this is something that we also need to talk about. It seems some misconception is that React Native or even all, all of the other frameworks, mobile development frameworks, are an all-in kind of thing, right? Look, you either develop your full app on React Native or you don't. And this is not entirely correct. We have an approach which is called the brownfield approach, which basically means within your bigger app, which is written in whatever you want, you can embed React Native inside of that app. You know, maybe it's for certain portions of the app, maybe it could be an entire section, an entire subcategory within the app. And this is the approach a lot of the bigger apps are taking, right? Because sometimes you might need the native performance, whatever that means. If you need a video editor, if you need a really large list of items, if you need some sort of access to the native APIs. But sometimes you might have screens that depend on different teams on your company, which they just need to move faster. They don't have the native expertise. So within these apps, you can just embed a React Native view or Expo view or even a Flutter view, right? Like whatever framework you're trying to use. And I think a lot of the misconception lies there. A lot of these apps might be written or the main core might be a fully native app written in Swift and Objective-C and Java, but you know they might have one or two components or they might be using React Native as a top layer to a deeper native implementation, which I think is the case for the Amazon Kindle apps which they are really architected around React Native, but the native implementation is a raw C renderer, right? Which is adjusted for the Kindle hardware. 
Now, it's also important to talk about the things that might not be publicly available or might not be as known, right? So there are other apps, let's say Coinbase, let's say Expensify, uh, which are really big companies that are also using React Native, but you won't really find them listed anywhere. That is because they don't care about this, right? They don't want to be publicized. It's just technology for them to kind of serve their customers and um, I can tell you that they're using this because I've personally worked with them. They are using my open source libraries, right? So there's a, let's say, a portion of the apps that will never be publicized in this way. Or the companies might not want to make it public that they're using a specific technology. Some issues might be just about the detection of React Native or any other framework that you might be using, right? The, video kind of goes into detail about the methodology decompiling an apk or an apa then kind of uh, searching for specific strings within the bundle but this is kind of hit and miss right like there are many ways to do this here you can see some people are looking at the native classes uh, to make sure that maybe you have the namespace of facebook reacting there you have xamarin uh, I have seen people, you know, looking for uh, dynamic libraries that might be in the bundle as well. You might check for the existence of a JavaScript file, right? Like you might look for a .js bundle, which is the, the compiled JavaScript file. But they're kind of hit and miss, right? Like, and there's a lot of sub subtlety here because technology is complex. You might be obfuscating how you're packaging your app um it might sit behind a server component or something like that so it's not as easy to say what's running what that's unfortunately the truth so the resources that we have right now from anecdotal evidence people publishing lists it's kind of a good indication but not the entire truth now the final point to touch is um, regarding the information out there and the people who publish all of these videos, all of these resources that might be hyping up React Native. But at the end of the day, and I agree with this, you should be taking with everything with a pinch of salt, right? Um, it doesn't really matter who's talking about things. We all have biases. And especially if we're our livelihoods depend on React Native. Like let's say me, myself, I have created a bunch of open source libraries for React Native. This is how I get customers. Um, I might not be 100% objective about React Native, but that being said, um, the information is out there, right? Like nobody's trying to hide things. Uh, you can read about the shortcomings of React Native but you should also be reading about what it can do for your team, right? Like it might allow you to move faster, uh, might, allow to, might allow you to onboard web developers into let's say native development with all of the tools that we have. So it might actually be good for you, your company, your team, your product. It's a decision that you might have to do yourself, right? So taking things with a pinch of salt is always good. One point that is mentioned is services that certain companies might provide right so for example you had code push which allowed you to send over the air updates to your react native app this was developed by microsoft it was a free service it was there for a long time but now it has been uh, retired and it has been taken up by expo which has pretty much the same module it allows you to bundle your javascript and send it over the air so you can have a quickly updated version of the app and again, this is not a conspiracy, right? Like we're just creating tooling that solves problems that takes advantage of the technology that we're using, in this case, JavaScript, which you can just send over the air, right? So again, it's a question of, do you need this? Do you see value in this? Um, then if yes or no, it's a thing that you will, your team will have to answer and um, you don't have to use it, right? Like you can just use the completely open source packages that don't depend on companies. You can try to solve all the problems by yourself, right? So nobody's kind of pushing you towards using a specific technology. At the end of the day, we have to agree with a certain level of um, rot 
right? The documentation is not great. The links of the community, they get out of date pretty soon because a lot of companies kind of go in and on out of the React Native train. But at the end of the day, it has a lot of tremendous amount of value. You can see it in big companies like Shopify, Tesla, Starlink, Facebook themselves, now Microsoft, Amazon, a lot of companies are using it. And it's something you cannot really argue against, right? It's out there, it's being used, uh, it has support. And uh, at the end of the day, it's a technology with pros and cons, which you will have to decide for yourself if it's something you want to invest on. You might get outsized returns, you might get moderate returns. Again, it all depends on the context. There's a lot of details out there. But in any case, I don't think it's fair to completely dismiss or call disingenuous what's out there. Uh, it might just be a consequence of creep and just chaos going into the ecosystem. In any case, I hope you one day get to try a React Native and you tell us about your experience.